The Restoration Trilogy, originally published at the Last Bestial blog in 2015, read to you by the author. Music courtesy of Alex X Aces Patriots. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. Any other content within this work that may not be covered by this CC BY NC SA license is hereby used under the sincere intention of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. Preface Amongst libertarians and patriots alike, there seems to be a predilection towards wishful thinking. Recognizing the warfare welfare state as one expression of authoritarian power is a good starting point, but then refusing to acknowledge that all taxation is theft because taxes infringe upon individual property rights is simply absurd. Philosophizing about what the Founding Fathers had to say is time well spent, yet believing that expatriation will remedy all of your political grievances is just naive. Mentioning to people that their natural right of self-defense is also applicable towards police officers is excellent, however attempting to guilt this same audience for not using politically correct lingo is nothing less than unconscionably offensive. My intention with this publication of these short fictional stories is to illustrate not only the nature of the situation we are all suffering under, but to also highlight the foolish as well as treacherous actions which exacerbate the tyranny ruling us all. Themes of compromise, appeasement, and betrayal abound in this creative work as more of a warning to readers to be wary of most so-called activists who tell them to do this or to do that, and especially those whom attempt to guilt trip them for their failure to perform these actions. Once you understand that these manipulative rock star divas who infest the alternative media, spread misinformation and even disinformation to their audiences, then I trust you can begin to understand, at least in part, why I felt this trilogy had to be written by someone. More importantly, I felt that it was high time that those who sincerely consider themselves to be freedom fighters have something resembling a vision for what they desire to achieve. Chronicling the evolution of human liberty from the European absolute monarchies through both the American Revolution and the subsequently, subsequent Whiskey Rebellion, I found it no small task to also futuristically extrapolate what the restoration of constitutional government might indeed look like. In the attempt to do just that, I figured it would be important to also describe a foreign country doing something similar at about the same time, but seeing as this wouldn't make sense for the Iranians to do, I chose the Korean Peninsula as the role model, thereby reversing the historical timeline, in a sense, of the French Revolution. Should anyone like to take these stories and develop them into a full-fledged novel, or even a feature-length film, I would wholeheartedly encourage them to do so. If anything, these stories are explaining the transitional phase from our current political situation to parts one and two of the plan for the restoration of constitutional government. Hell, a cinematic trilogy about the plan would be even better, because that would demonstrate more specifically how the current Anglo-American empire could be thrown off, as well as how the several American republics could be successfully restored. A truly inspiring movie trilogy, rivaling in popularity to that of The Hunger Games or Atlas Shrugged, about securing our liberties would tickle me pink something fierce. Kyle Reardon, Austin, Texas. January 2015. You have just heard the preface to The Restoration Trilogy, originally published at the Last Best Deal blog in 2015, read to you by the author. Thank you for listening, and laissez-faire. The Parable of the Mugger's Sandwich, the first installment of the Restoration Trilogy, was originally published at the Last Bestial blog in 2014, read to you by the author. 
music courtesy of Darth Duba's Story of Life and Rocker 206's Moonlight Sonata. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. Any other content within this work that may not be covered by this CCBY NCSA license is hereby used under the sincere intention of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. The following is a fictional story, hence why it's a parable. One evening, a long time ago, Joe Citizen was freely traveling the roads on his way home from work. Suddenly, a dark figure emerged from the alley. Joe was startled, and before he could do anything else, the stranger asked him for the time. Naively, Joe glanced at his watch, but before he could reply, a revolver was pressed against his temple. After taking all the money Joe had on him, the mugger quickly fled. Shaking from the anxiety he felt at just being robbed, Joe didn't know what to do. The money that was stolen from him was worth half a week's paycheck, so Joe soon became concerned about how he was going to pay his bills. Knowing little else about what to do, Joe proceeded to continue on home. Meanwhile, the mugger arrived at his lair and showed off the loot to his fellow thieves. Upon seeing how much was stolen, they advised the mugger that he should temper the shock of the robbery itself by buying Joe something that showed that he wasn't really that much of a bad guy. Seeing this as a way to possibly escape the natural justice of the surrounding community, the mugger went to a delicatessen and bought a sandwich. Only a little later, Joe was surprised again by the mugger's reappearance. This time, Joe flinched, but his curiosity was piqued by the fact that the mugger extended his hand, revealing a sandwich. Perplexed more than anything, Joe asked the mugger why he wanted to gift him a sandwich, in <laughs> especially in light of their previous encounter. Discovering that the sandwich was bought with the proceeds from the mugging, for despite his thievery, the mugger was no liar, Joe became indignant at the mugger's audacity by knocking the sandwich out of his hand and into the street. By now, a crowd had begun to form around the two men, intrigued by the nature of their situation. Once they had learned the facts of the case, for neither of them were liars, they then deliberated amongst themselves until they had appointed John Q. Public to speak on their behalf. John subsequently announced that the mugger was not guilty of any crime because he had returned with an offer of a sandwich, which Joe had refused, despite the fact that the mugger still kept the majority of Joe's stolen money. In fact, it was Joe who was in the wrong, because, as John explained, Joe should have been grateful that the mugger had offered a sandwich in the first place. Therefore, by refusing to accept the sandwich, Joe had forfeited the rest of his own stolen money. Bewildered by this public opinion, Joe was at a total loss as to what he could do. As everyone began dispersing, not only did John look down upon Joe, but the mugger also sneered at him as well. Joe gradually discovered over the following days and months that the entire town had ostracized him because of the stink he had raised about his own mugging. Some years went by, and Joe's daughter was traveling the same route back home from work when the mugger's son similarly robbed her at gunpoint as well. The entire situation played out nearly identically as it had originally transpired between Joe and the mugger before, although this time it ended a bit harsher for Joe's daughter because she was scolded by the very same John Q. public for wasting the sandwich. As John explained, the sandwich could have been used to feed the town's sick children. She too, like her father before her, was soon ostracized by the townsfolk for causing a similar ruckus. Decades later, one of Joe's descendants chose a very different response than her ancestors before her had done. Instead of simply handing over her money, she shot her mugger at point-blank range. John Q. Public proclaimed that henceforth, anyone who shot a mugger in self-defense will be burned alive at the stake because by now, as a social custom, all muggers had offered their victims a wonderful selection of sandwiches to choose from. 
Despite her heartfelt protests, she was seized and bound by the same men who prowled the streets late at night. Although a few people were inspired by her execution to go punish these muggers themselves, the majority of the town decried such activities, claiming them to be lawless and criminal. Centuries went by, and the same scenario replayed itself many times. Although the names and incidental details changed, the formula remained exactly the same, as were the public opinions announced by John Q. Public's heirs. Never again would the town's muggers ever be prosecuted or otherwise held to account for their crimes against the townsfolk, for as long as they kept to the traditional precedent of offering sandwiches to their victims, then the interests of justice were satisfied as far as the conscience of the community was concerned. And everyone lived miserably ever after. You have just heard the Parable of the Mugger's Sandwich, the first installment of the Restoration Trilogy, originally published at the Last Bestial blog in 2014 and read to you by the author. Thank you for listening, and laissez-faire. An Allegory of the Freedom Train, the second installment of the Restoration Trilogy, was originally published at the Last Bestial blog in 2014, read to you by the author. Music courtesy of Spook Nukem's Reflect and Odd Fellow Floyd's Bridge Jumper. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, Non-Commercial, Sharealike 4.0 International License. Any other content within this work that may not be covered by this CCBYNCSA license is hereby used under the sincere intention of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. The following is an extended metaphor, hence why it's an allegory. If you haven't yet listened to The Parable of the Mugger's Sandwich, then please do so before listening to this fictional story. A long time ago, there was a megalopolis whose downtown brimmed in a thousand points of light. This sprawling cityscape soon became the technological and social center of a quickly growing empire. Despite the glorious marvels found only in the downtown area, there were other boroughs of the city where its inhabitants were barely living at all. Their ramshackle tenements felt as if they were about to buckle at the seams at any given moment. An air of desperation was all too common amongst the people here, and anything that offered itself as a reliable means of escape was considered to be very valuable indeed. To paraphrase a David Bowie song, the flies were the size of rats, stacked upon rats the size of cats. It wasn't just the fact that dilapidated shelters were the norm here. It was also the fact that no one lived here in what they would have considered to be their own homes. For instance, it was rather typical for meddling neighbors to demand the intervention of a constable for every minor inconvenience you could imagine, and many times for even no problem at all. A culture of tattletelling was emulated right here in the tenements, because it made many of the people here feel as if they weren't that different from their wealthier counterparts who lived downtown. Unsurprisingly, this engendered an opposing counterculture of those who simply wanted to live in peace with their neighbors without the meddling interference of the constables on a nearly daily basis. These brave and unrelenting souls approached their troublesome neighbors in several different ways over the many years. They argued, bargained, and sometimes even made compromises in order to find a resolution that would please both parties. Alas, every heroic effort resulted in stupendous failure, and many of those who had initially resisted their troublesome neighbors eventually became just like them. Dissension and bickering soon followed, and the effort to live in any form of tranquility in the city with one's neighbors virtually collapsed. Yet there was a remnant who understood that the desire to interfere with one's neighbors ran quite deeply, and ultimately they realized that there was no way to strike a deal with them, 
or compromise in any way, since such efforts had been repeatedly tried and had always failed. This remnant eventually proposed an original, if radical, solution to this age-old problem, leaving the city behind forever. Much dissension within the ranks followed, although eventually such bickering ceased once the eldest of the remnant pointed out that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Soon preparations were underway for the great escape from the city. The first major consideration was the mode of transportation. Much debate ensued, but it was eventually agreed upon that a train was the best option. It was cheaper than flying an airplane, yet it was quicker to build than a long caravan of automobiles. A train had just enough room to fit them all, albeit quite tightly packed together, or so said its designers. Most importantly, the construction of the train and its rails would be decried by city officials and potentially halted, so time would be of the essence if this ambitious effort were to be pulled off successfully. As predicted, once construction was underway, the Metropolitan Authorities condemned the project, propagandizing that it would rip the social fabric of the city apart by suggesting it was possible to leave the city en masse. Some of these authorities even went so far to try and sabotage the building of the rail line by pretending to join the project, fabricating phony complaints from non-existent neighbors, and then using these complaints to tattletale on some of the train's builders. Although these poor souls were ripped away from constructing the train by the constables, most of the workers never found themselves in such trouble, and after some hesitation, everyone else went back to work more diligently than ever before. Finally, the train and its rail were completed. Seeing no reason to delay its departure, and also seeing how impotent the city's officials were at stopping its construction, these people set a date that in later years became known as Independence Day. On that day, there were celebrations, whooping, and speechifying. After the train was stuffed to the hilt with passengers, it began to pull out of the city. There were numerous swarms of people running after the train as it slowly began to gain speed, trying to catch onto the outside of the train before they worked their way inside. Some people who failed to catch the train, or otherwise stay on it, fell off on the outskirts of the city while also suffering injuries ranging from light bruising to broken collarbones. After that hardest push to get the train moving, those who sought freedom from the city and its arbitrary constraints had set off on what they thought of as their great adventure. What they soon discovered was that there were various railway stations along the way whose memorial plaques told them that these stations had been built by those who had come before. A few passengers got off at this first stop, and they chose a leader who had proven himself capable of fending off hostile savages. His son would eventually take his place, as would his eldest son, for several generations. The supermajority of the train's passengers, however, did not prefer this particular scheme, so they stayed on the train to see what the next stop had in, had in store for them. What the passengers began debating with each other over was which train stop was the best one to get off at. Passionate speeches were made about how this stop or that stop was the one that offered the most capable social arrangement for making sure neighbors don't interfere with each other. The train would stop at a couple of stations, and a few people at each one would disembark, but the vast majority of passengers stayed on the train just to see if they could bear witness to an even better outcome. Before too long, one passenger reminded the entirety of the train that, in accordance with their own stated principles, they should stop at each station and passively allow whomever wanted to depart to do so. Simply because of the decision about whether or not to get off at a particular stop was primarily a deeply personal one. Once the commotion over this new proposal had settled down, most passengers nodded in agreement, even though some of them felt this idea left a bad taste in their mouths, for they had wanted a solution that would be applied equally to everyone. So on it went, with some passengers stepping off the train at the next stop, but most choosing to stay on it and see how far they could go. One rather vocal minority of the train went even so far as to argue that they will only get off the train once they have reached the end of the line. The majority scoffed at this, claiming that there is nothing beyond the end of the rail, and that everyone must get off only when the train stops at a station, since by now all of them had discovered that the rail line that they had constructed had now blended in with an older rail, which had been built by the same folks who had built this series of train stations. Towards the end of the line, there was 
one last stop at a rail station where the remaining bulk of the passengers disembarked. Throngs of bodies dotted the train platform, and that same minority who had wanted to go to the end of the line grinned in anticipation of what they considered to be their just reward. Right before the last of the willing passengers had stepped off the train, some of those who had assumed the guise of leadership convinced the rest of the passengers on the platform that it was wrong for even that tiny minority to see the end of the line, much less leave the train for it. By inciting the crowd, these self-appointed representatives stepped in front of the stopped train, drew their guns, and open fired. They killed every last one of the remaining passengers. Much time passed, and those who got off at this last train stop had originally built a relatively small fishing village, which then expanded into a small town, then a larger town, eventually a medium-sized city, and finally into a megalopolis, which bore an uncanny resemblance to the one their ancestors had originally fled. Unfortunately, these new city officials had learned from the previous Great Escape and had forbidden the building of any trains or rail lines that would take people away from the city. Inevitably, there grew a disgruntled minority who wanted to leave this city, but alas, they found themselves trapped, perhaps forever, unless they found another way. Maybe those electrical inventions by that Serbian immigrant could become useful to them. But, for the foreseeable future, they all continued to live miserably ever after. You have just heard an allegory of the Freedom Train, the second installment of the Restoration Trilogy, originally published at the Last Bestial blog in 2014 and read to you by the author. Thank you for listening, and laissez-faire. A Tale of Proverbs on the Five Boxes, the third concluding installment of the Restoration Trilogy, was originally published at the Last Bestial blog in 2015, read to you by the author. Music courtesy of Ashley Alicize's A Puzzling Predicament, A Dangerous Situation, and my own remixed version of Brayton's North Wind. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share-alike 4.0 international license. Any other content within this work that may not be covered by this CC BY NC SA license is hereby used under the sincere intention of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. The following is a set of proverbs within a frame story. If you haven't yet listened to either The Parable of the Mugger's Sandwich or an allegory of the Freedom Train, then please do so before listening to this concluding installment of this fictional trilogy. Penelope and Charlie, are you two ready for tonight's story? Oh, good, I'm glad. I think you'll enjoy this one, since you both worked so hard on your lessons today. I know your mother wanted to spend some time alone with your father, and quite frankly, I could use the change of pace from the Life Extension Conference I attended last week, where I gave the keynote address about the viability of total organ regeneration. But I doubt such a talk would interest you unless you were a gray-haired old scientist like me. Settle down, settle down. If I'd have known any better, I'd say you two are the most rambunctious pair of fraternal twins in all of Appalachia. Despite the fact that I'm a hale and hearty man of 62 does not therefore mean I'm a limitless source of energy, like the geothermal conductor your parents used to heat this house. Speaking of which, I like to light this musty old fireplace here in the den to try and set the mood. For while this tale might sound like ancient history, it's actually quite a good adventure story. Or at least I think so. You have to remember that it was a very different time long ago. 
There were criminals who murdered, enslaved, and even stole from the people on a regular basis. Although some of these murderers, slavers, and thieves would be punished, the most successful of them were confidence artists who tricked the people into giving up their own personal responsibility in return for a promise of protection against the supposed evils of the world. What the people got instead were muggers bribing victims with sandwiches. A great deal of time passed, and eventually some people became quite fed up with this horrible arrangement, so they attempted to escape it as best as they could. Even though it seemed as if this could work alone, what they soon discovered was that most of the Freedom Train's passengers had condoned the slaughter of those who had wanted to live without rulers. And with that betrayal, the cycle of oppression began again. Not too long after, despotism reemerged with a vengeance, but this time with the capability of literally destroying all life on Earth many times over. Prisons became overcrowded, indebtedness skyrocketed, and mad scientists implemented their eugenics agenda. The people had become equally enslaved, much to the delight of the social justice warriors. Into this sorry state of affairs came into being what eventually became known as a set of proverbs detailing the rise of humanity into our current age. These proverbs of the five boxes, originally three boxes, describe how our ancestors tried every peaceful solution conceivable to the mind of man in reining in the tyrannical impulses dormant within the lowest depths of the human psyche. Telling these proverbs to our children is a way for us to honor our heritage of hard-won liberty. You must also understand that within each of these proverbs, there are hostile factions who are deeply opposed to each other. Statists, my dear grandchildren, are those criminals and their sycophants who worship the false god called government, which according to their belief system, bestows upon a select few the superhuman ability to be exempt from common morality. For example, their murders were called wars, their kidnappings were called jailing, and their stealing was called taxation. Reformists were those well-meaning but naive souls who incorrectly believed that if they were to strike compromises and deals with the statists, then freedom could flourish. But alas, all of their political projects ended in notorious disasters, time and time again. And lastly, there were the restorers or restorationists, who through trial and tribulation were thankfully successful in dismantling the most dangerous superstition to ever plague the human condition. Having laid out the situation of that time so long ago, let's proceed with the first proverb, shall we? The Ballot Box During the Age of Tribulation, our ancestors struggled against the trickiest forms of statism. One of these arrangements was where most of the people would, from time to time, choose which of the muggers would hand out what kinds of sandwiches to their victims. Of course, those who had chosen a different mugger would not be able to enjoy the sandwiches he would have given out had he enjoyed greater support from his victims. As you could have guessed, if some of the people received a mugger who handed out sandwiches they disliked, they were told they could always wait for the next election cycle and then vote him out. Naturally, it didn't take too long for people to realize that this was a rigged game, and the restorers suggested that the only way to really win was not to play this game at all. Sadly, the reformists insisted that if everybody just moved to the smallest tax plantation, then they could much more easily vote out the muggers in public office and replace them with their own trustworthy people who, presumably, would radically change the entire situation by simply mugging the rest of the people a whole lot less frequently, as well as by giving out only turkey, ham, and chicken sandwiches to their victims. As such, the people usually sided with either the statists or the reformists, because they figured that anyone who failed to participate in these government elections deserved whatever sandwiches they ended up with. It didn't matter that the restorers went out of their way to scientifically prove that such electoral voting was fraudulent. Whether they debunked the myths of the rational voter, defensive or protest voting, or the lesser of two evils, the evidence supporting such debunking was either routinely ignored 
or disingenuously ridiculed by both statists and reformists alike. A lifetime could easily have been spent by the restorers trying to gradually sway these elections to the point where the best they could hope for in their lifetimes was slightly more limited mugging. And this, my dear grandchildren, is where our proverb that correctly says, if you do vote, you cannot complain, is based upon. For our ancestors realized that if you choose a mugger, any mugger, you are agreeing to the outcome of that contest ahead of time, just as a man who gambles his weekly paycheck away is agreeing to abide by the outcome of his bet, regardless of whether he wins or loses, lest he become a sore winner, or worse, a man who welches on his debts. What, Penelope? Oh, I see what you mean. Didn't the people have the right to choose their own leaders? Ha! It is one thing to seek leaders for yourself, but it is a whole different ballgame if you are imposing rulers onto others. The deadly error of the ballot box was that it co-mingled these two very different actions beyond recognition, and in effect became little else than a slave suggestion box. Bickering about whom is allowed to use such a box is little else than a notorious distraction that has nothing at all to do with the cause for liberty. Leaving behind this failed experiment, let us proceed to the next one. The Jury Box Sometime after John Q. Public died, there was a tradition that even the worst of statists honored. It was the ability of the people to have a say about how the rules were imposed upon a particular individual within a specific set of circumstances. Many scholars of that time attributed this as the only possible way to successfully rein in the excesses committed by John Q. Public's heirs. A disgruntled lawyer who lived a few centuries ago once wrote that the people enjoyed the right to judge the law as well as the facts of a case brought before them for adjudication by voting their conscience, regardless of the judge's instructions to them. This same lawyer also pointed out that this ancient common law right had been rendered moot by the government's increasing despotism over the course of the 19th century. Reformists, in their typically breezy manner, oh so conveniently neglected the second half of this lawyer's argument by only emphasizing the first half in order to spur up frenetic activity that, in the end, would spin the people around in circles, much like a snake eating its own tail. Groups of people began suggesting that perhaps education about this ancient right would increase the probability of it being exercised. The assumption was tested in case after case for several decades, but the reformists appear to ignore the implications of the results. Each time, regardless of whether the jurors were given every possible advantage or notice of their ancient right, jury after jury chose guilty verdicts without fail, no matter how arbitrary or capricious the charges the defendant faced. I suspect one major reason why juries usually let defendants hung out to dry was because jurors were just as captive as the defendants themselves were. Consider for a moment how a game of prisoner's dilemma works, except that the game here is skewed heavily in favor of the jurors and strongly against the defendant. The worst any juror would face would be either a relatively minor penalty fee or a few nights in jail, whereas a defendant almost always stood to lose so much more. Worst yet, jurors had more options about how they could act, as opposed to a defendant whose only real choices were, the, were to either accept a plea deal or fight the charges and risk losing noticeably more than if he had just taken the plea deal. Consider also the so-called jury tax, which was a heavier punishment levied against a convicted defendant for choosing to exercise his right to a jury trial, but then losing his case. Suddenly, a juror choosing to switch his vote during jury deliberations just so he could leave the courthouse an hour or two earlier than if he had chosen to stick to his conscience, and then your average juror's decision-making begins to appear rather, well, calculating. But... And this is a rather large but. The way a legal case is presented before the jury has to follow court procedures, such as their rules of evidence, which, of course, the people had no say as to what those rules would have been in the first place. 
As if this wasn't bad enough, if you weren't a registered voter, then you wouldn't be even put on a federal jury wheel. And if you were neither a registered voter nor a licensed driver, then you wouldn't be put on the Texas jury wheel either. Speak up, Charlie. I think my hearing unit is failing a bit. Oh, where's Texas, you say? My boy, Texas is so far west as to be on the other shore of the great Mississippi River. And as to your other question about whether it's a different country, <laughs> answering that should be saved for another evening. Saddest of all, though, was the fact that the supermajority of these court cases never made it to trial, usually because the defendants were intimidated by the jury tax, and thus chose to accept a plea deal. So if the jurors were going to railroad the defendant just so they could leave earlier anyway, because none of them wanted to be there in the first place, much like prison or school, then why should any defendant place the slightest amount of trust in jurors to be fair and impartial arbitrators of justice? They didn't. And like the game of Prisoner's Dilemma, they usually chose the plea deal because they understood, if only intuitively, that they would be badly hurt by both the jury and the government, more likely than not, if they didn't cooperate with the prosecutor. Most glaringly, the competency of jurors is arguably comparable to that of voters. Jury wheels, jury selection, and ultimately jury verdicts are proudly held by reformists to be constituted totally randomly, rather than base the composition of jurors based on their uh, capabilities and willingness to do justice, they are instead assembled out of a lottery from a lot of miscreants and cowards who will do anything to escape their predicament. Grand juries rubber-stamped prosecutorial indictments, and petite juries were filled with these people who simply weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty, yet who were expected by statists to render judgments as to truly serious matters of guilt or innocence. Despite all this, my dear grandchildren, there were even some restorers who adhered to the proverb that I'd rather be tried by twelve than carried by six. To illustrate the idea that the jury box, at best, is not one that should be relied upon as a way of winning back one's freedom, but rather as a mostly unreliable last-ditch rearguard action to only be used when all other better options have been exhausted. With that said, it's time to proceed onward towards a frequently ignored artifice. The Soapbox Now, while reformists primarily champion the first two boxes, this one straddles the boundary of effective action, just as a shadow would between light and darkness. For it could be used to propagandize, or it could equally be used to tell truths that are necessary to understand before bringing the entire system down to its knees. Free speech and a free press were truly beautiful things, if they could have been exercised without undue hardship, much like openly carrying a gun. Alas, such was not the case. Believe it or not, there were forms of soft censorship used to stifle the remnants of the free press. Federal copyright law was used to silence those who produced video press releases as well as others who had only copied songs from the corporate music industry, if not both. For instance, black hat hackers would game the system by filing false copyright claims on the old dinosaur YouTube website, simply for the purpose of learning the personal identities of various uploaders, the knowledge of which they'd use to harass and threaten them further. Another problem was that statists would occasionally use the statements of any journalist as evidence against him in the government courts. For example, my parents made me memorize the following hearsay rule that was common throughout the former United States, which said that a statement cannot be hearsay if, quote, the statement is offered against a party and is the party's own statement in either an individual or representative capacity, close quote. In other words, anything you say can and will be used against you by statists in order to seal your freedom and your property away from you and they will do this by way of government law. For example, if you were writing a letter to the editor that Americans should consider using their common right of revolution to cast off the yoke of tyranny, all the social justice warriors would come out of the woodwork and accuse you of being an advocate of violence, if not also try to drag you into court on the grounds of incitement 
despite the fact that such political content was totally legal at that time, according to the government's own lawyers. It wasn't just the government's laws that infringed upon the free press. Oh no, my grandchildren, it was also the incessant conflict generated by many who claimed to oppose government media. Sensationalism, not truth, was the prime currency, as misinformation and disinformation took precedence over reliable intelligence. News cycled junkies and inept researchers promoted myths and half-truths, which ended up serving only the tyrants. Confidence artists scammed well-intentioned donators out of their discretionary income. Social justice warriors inculcated false guilt in the minds of their victims only because they were both angered and jealous of their lifestyle preferences. Most importantly, the never-ending bickering and infighting with its concomitant strains of bullying and death threats only benefited those who wanted their 15 minutes of fame, but not those who had wanted to spread the message of liberty. Repeat that again, Penelope. Ah, wouldn't all that infighting discourage people from opposing those bad men who pretended to be government? Well, my dear, yes it would, and it, and it did. A few people realized how these dynamics worked, but by the time they did, it was already much too late for the remnants of the free press. Ironically, participation in this so-called alternative media, in fact, violated individual privacy more often than not. Smeared were the good reputations of decent people, and baseless accusations held more sway than any exculpatory evidence, mainly because there was no semblance of due process or basic fairness. As a result, many lovers of liberty saw their employment and business opportunities vanish, since there was no remedy for them to even try and regain their good name. This, coupled with the scammers who promoted things like activist legal defense funds, were the causes behind why many restorers becoming more impoverished and disillusioned than they were before, and thus it served as a punitive disincentive against those who opposed the government. An obscure blogger at the time remarked that his greatest fear wasn't persecution from the government, necessarily, but rather the alternative media slowly mutating into an internet version of statist media, hence the name calling of gun owners as violence advocates. He attributed this in large part to the destruction of language we now know full well as verbicide, which, you must keep in mind, was a little known concept at the time. Ultimately, he became quite despondent and chose to give up on any notion of spreading a message of any kind, at least publicly, that is. In one of his final articles, he explained that almost nobody was listening, and of those who did, they stubbornly refused to act, instead preferring to simply repeat what he himself had said on a variety of given topics. So, children, the adage provided by a more well-known author that... In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act, was more true than even most of the restorers gave it credit for. Of course, both the statists and reformists were more than comfortable telling the noble lie, as long as it served their nefarious purposes. What became of those restorers who were still bracing the free press together with little more than bailing wire and duct tape was that they finally shifted their focus from expressing their grievances to teaching their audiences how to resist the government's police forces, because for all intents and purposes, they might as well have been living in 1930s Germany. Having closed the door to that particular avenue, let's next explore what happened to those who had resisted in a foolish manner. The Pine Box The shared assumption behind the three previous boxes was that there was some kind of peaceful solution to the age-old problem of tyranny. Elections, juries, and even the news cycle all served to perpetuate the notion that if you only play by the tyrant's own rules, then you will defeat him at some point. Whether it be by persuasion, gambling, or embarrassment, these approaches fail to address the root of statism itself, namely, the mindless obedience to authority. It was this very obedience, Charlie and Penelope, that directly led to the massive numbers of humans who died at the altar of so-called public policy. During the 20th century alone, there were 284,638,000 
people murdered by government, and that number did not include those who were killed in war, whether they be military or civilian casualties during either world war or the many smaller ones that took place as well. If that fact does not make you shudder to your core as to the dangerously unstable nature of all government, then I honestly don't know what will. Some good people back then debated with each other as to whether or not this was a malfunction of constitutional republicanism, or if all governments, no matter their form or structure, would always degrade back into tyranny, because that is its natural design. Ultimately, though, it didn't really matter too much either way, because the result was exactly the same. No one with a conscience would be able to deny the many grievances expressed by the people who had suffered under the yoke of a despotism whose weaponry had the capability to destroy this planet many times over in their mad rush for absolute power over the entire human race. Moral indignation of those who imagine themselves to be our rulers served as the backbone needed to grow and sustain an effective resistance, disregarding their laws as whims of the self-appointed political class Freedom fighters across a range of political ideologies banded together in the common cause for the restoration of our liberty. Sadly, as these things tend to go, the reformists butted heads with the restorers as to how best resist the statists. Civil disobedience became the tactic of choice, and peaceful evolution the long-term strategy of the reformists. They would encourage average people to not only disobey unjust laws, but to also do so blatantly and out in the open. Some of the restorers observed this behavior, labeling it teasing the bear and advising against it, not because they opposed civil disobedience on principle, but because they advocated a wiser application of it that was much more discreet. In response to this criticism, the reformists performed their final act of betrayal to the cause of liberty when they routinely labeled the restorers as advocates of violence. Ironically, such so-called peaceful resistance only ended up increasing the wrath of the tyrants upon the people, for reasons I've already mentioned. Worse yet, much of the techniques for doing so were ineffective, and what methods did actually work were seldom used. Only what was actively promoted by the reformists ever got any serious consideration by the majority of people who resisted government, because they owned the noticeable competition to state-approved corporate media. Those who persisted in this bad strategy also failed in its execution by not taking the proper precautions. For instance, there was no estate planning, no will, no nest eggs, no last wishes, and no prepaid funerals arranged ahead of time. Practitioners of Satagariha ultimately ended up dying in government prisons, irresponsibly failing to provide for their own families. Reformists who persisted in this course of action shouldn't have expected any flag-draped coffins or a 21-gun salute at Arlington National Cemetery, like they'd expect from a Tom Clancy novel. The best anyone could hope for at their own funerals would be attendance from their good family and close friends, who then pass around a bundle of burning sage before shooting an arrow into the sky as their homemade coffin was lowered into the earth. Don't get me wrong, we're all mortal. But what I am trying to say here is that it doesn't matter how you died so much as how well you lived, and it would seem that the reformists had forgotten that. Because of this stems the phrase, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Although its sentiment is certainly more admirable than rolling over and groveling before the feet of tyrants, it stops awfully short of its potential to do some real good in the world. Meditating on death, as the medieval Japanese samurai did, can be useful in making peace with one's mortality, but it is unhelpful if one is attempting to inspire courage. Now having examined the consequences of half-measures, as well as of failure despite the best of intentions, let us now proceed to the final and most important box. The Cartridge Box. If there is ever a devil... The state is it. That is why the founders of the former United States insisted on maintaining and strengthening the militia system. Because they viewed government as a necessary evil, they understood that the only truly effective check on the power of any government 
is for the common people to use their privately owned weapons to deter and even repel the king's guards. As one of those former guards warned back then, tyranny cannot come to the door of any American unless it comes in uniform. You must keep in mind, grandchildren, that revolutions are internal, whereas restoring independence is external. This understanding, coupled with an appreciation for leaderless resistance, should impress upon you the dynamics inherent in the evolution of human liberty. Only a unity of purpose, not a unity of structure, would ever be the appropriate expression of any broad solidarity. People back then routinely confused freedom with comfort. Before the Korean reunification of the 2020s, those who had been natively born in the southern half of the peninsula, as well as the expatriates from the northern half, considered life south of the demilitarized zone, DMZ, to be freer than in the north. However, both governments had constitutions, and both constitutions recognized many civil rights, including suffrage, free speech, and privacy of correspondence. Interestingly, neither Korean constitution enumerated the right to keep and bear arms. Just because you could use a cellular telephone in the South does not therefore mean that you are free, but what it certainly does mean is that you are more comfortable. Unlike the German reunification of the 1990s or the American reunification of the 1860s, the Koreans decided to try living without government for a while, and to their surprise, they enjoyed it very much. Korean imitation of the civil defiance, earlier demonstrated by Americans during the Bundy Affair, was paramount in their ability to deter and ultimately repel both governments forcibly. South Korean dissidents, who were inspired by the restorers, marched around Seoul wearing holstered pistols. Following the mass arrests of these demonstrators, the North Korean expats gathered around one of the police stations and smoked cannabis until they too were thrown into the same cells. This event, which became known as the Seoul Roundup, inspired the show of force in Pyongyang of peasants armed only with their pitchforks who were finally challenging the legitimacy of the communist government. With no more need for the DMZ, the American military stationed there returned home in order to suppress the popular uprisings in Atlanta, Milwaukee, and Topeka, but ultimately to no avail because nearly all those who had been on duty chose to not just disobey their superior officers, but to also join the growing resistance by hunting down and punishing the worst statists. By 2032, the long-suffering restorers had won their freedom back, but at no small sacrifice. Reformists condemned both the American restorers and the Koreans for breaking the law, as this would destabilize both countries by, inv by inviting chaos, or so they said. Despite their repeated failures with elections, juries, and news, the reformists insisted on pushing forward a strategy of peaceful evolution on the grounds that if they simply could win some hearts and minds by chaining honorably discharged veterans to the doors of government buildings and then filming the subsequent police brutality, then this would magically accomplish something, somewhere, somehow. Needless to say, their failures were quite impressively astounding. You can tell a lot about a government by how its law enforcement officers normally treat the citizenry. House raids normally included police officers shooting the family dog in cold blood or tasing women asleep in their beds. Once the public executions were being held in town squares to the sound of government trumpets blaring, guerrillas emerged who then began their combat operations by doing such things as pouring sand into the gas tanks of police cars. Just like the American colonists and Texan settlers before them, the restorers organized local committees of safety in their neighbors, neighborhoods and counties in order to bring a degree of stability to their respective areas of operation. These committees of safety, once they had established themselves as pillars of their communities, 
began recruitment for the formation of openly armed militia units who would meet in local parks to practice close order drill and conduct physical fitness training as disciplined units. Much of what followed was quite an exciting time. Politicians and their minions were targeted, as were the gendarmerie, the latter of whom were summarily executed on the spot. The strategy and tactics of the restorers was much like the Viet Cong guerrillas of the 1960s, but with the technological roles reversed. Such an effort would have been impossible to mount without the logistical planning before the outbreak of active hostilities. For decades, many stockpilers began squirreling away materiel that one day could be used if any of the normal supply chains ever broke down, even if only temporarily. These stockpiles were quickly put to use by the guerrillas and their many allies, and because of this, the stockpilers became one of the most important support sections for the restorers of constitutional government. Once the many committees of safety began coalescing into larger committees, as the small white dots grew to eventually overshadow the black areas, then governance transitioned to the Constitutional Compliance Convention, whose duty it was to guide the orderly dissolution of the tyrannical empire and the long-sought-for restoration of these United States. A few decades went by, and there were those who felt as if government really was an unnecessary evil. Public debates and many referendums were issued among this, amongst this rather enlightened people, who had not too long before had regained their hard-won republics, and were now faced with the very real prospect of experimenting with limited government much more so, perhaps even to the point of extinction. First, the American Southwest, followed closely by Texas and then the Pacific Northwest, abolished their respective governments because their executive and judicial functions had already been replaced by the private production of security services alongside multi-tiered third-party arbitration that was sold in a truly freed market by competing dispute resolution firms. Used during both the earlier American and Texan struggles for independence, the well-known phrase, come and take it, was again pressed into use by the restorers in order to emphasize that the use of weapons to kill government agents, including so-called law enforcement or police officers, was truly indeed the last resort in the defense of freedom. Since that time, absolutely no one has dared to question the idea that firearms are liberty's teeth, and as such, it is vitally important to maintain good hygiene. Evolving past the most dangerous superstition was only made possible by the tireless actions of those who came before you, who suffered, fought, and often died, just so you and your children would be able to taste the sweet nectar of liberty. Incumbent it is upon you to maintain this fine tradition of ours by adhering to our libertarian values, lest the future descend again into the same bottomless pit of subjugation and oppression. Never be tempted into giving up your freedom for anything, and perhaps, one day, humanity might just assume its rightful place amongst the stars. And now, my dearest grandchildren, it is time for bed, yet a part of me doubts this is in any way the end. For that could only be if the people living back then had chosen the bonds of slavery over the blessings of liberty. I think that what I have told you tonight is evidence that their faith in us has been duly rewarded more so than any of us could have ever imagined. That being said, off to bed with you. Good night. You have just heard a tale of Proverbs on the Five Boxes, the concluding installment of the Restoration Trilogy, originally published at the Last Bastille blog in 2015 and read to you by the author. Thank you for listening, and laissez-faire.
The Bona Ghost System Bundle gives the beginning, or advanced self-liberator an affordable, and user-friendly way, to step up their security culture, in both the physical and digital second realms. Featuring two privacy-hardened devices, hardware hacked by our friend Jam and by Conic. 1. The Ghost Phone, a D-Google Pixel 3a with Calyx OS. 2. Phonopad Basic, Ghostpad T420 a privacy laptop, and a Faraday bag, to take your devices offline. This Phono Ghost System bundle is exclusively available via Liberty Under Attack Publications. Learn more or order today, libertyunderattack.com forward slash g-h-o-s-t-b-u-n-d-l-e-1. In this technological age, at least right now, some interaction with the digital Babylon beast is necessary. But when we are pushed toward interacting, let us instead choose devices that we own, ones that aren't programmed to rat us out, ones that are as secure as humanly possible, while also balancing the need for an easy user experience. Again, visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash g-h-o-s-t-b-u-n-d-l-e-1 to order the first ever Vonu Ghost System Bundle. Again libertyunderattack.com forward slash g-h-o-s-t-b-u-n-d-l-e-1. See you in the digital second realm.